good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever is appropriate for uh, where you're listening. My name is Fred Jensen, and today I'm going to be talking about PowerLog 971 Python extensions and using the uh, machine learning for unsupervised FACES classification. If you already have PowerLog 971, then you will be able to run this almost immediately. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get Jupyter started. And the Jupyter notebooks are going to be, we send them with the PowerLog Pi distribution that we sent as part of the PowerLog distribution. And you can start your Jupyter notebooks here. And you'll note that we also have the notebooks stored in a file under the Pi distribution. And we give you some examples to start off with, and this is where you would put new notebooks that you're building or stuff like that. So the notebook we're going to be looking at today is an unsupervised classification multi-well. Uh, as you can see, it evolved, and this is where we ended up in being. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and clear all the outputs because we just want to do that. And here's our Jupyter workflow. Now, Jupyter is a nice interface for writing Python scripts because you have the ability of writing code and you have the ability of putting in what are called markdowns. And markdowns are where you can put comments or instructions or any kind of, of text files or images that you're interested in putting into the uh, Jupyter workflow. And so you have, an, you have the markdowns here and you have the code here. Um, the workflow starts here with, it tells, gives you instructions. It says select the wells in PowerLog and run the cell below to populate the data set. So we've got some Barnett wells over here. And we're going to grab, the more you grab, the longer it takes to run. So we're just going to grab one, two, five of them, five wells. And you can set your interval here, your grid, and you can list the curves that you want to fetch. And you can change these curve names if you follow the syntax exactly. Uh, and these are the where you can control what the workflow is going to do. Now, once I highlight a cell in Jupyter, I then can go and I can run that cell. And I'm going to run it, but there's a thing about Jupyter. Jupyter is the only one of the ways to run Python extensions that does not start the server automatically. So it helps if you start the server first. I think that's the first time I remember to do that before getting the error message. So now I'm going to run the cell. And it's going to do it's going to run the highlighted cell. You can run below. You can run, you know, all sorts of functions. But here I'm going to run the cell. And it's going to run. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to describe the data. I could run all the cells and just go through what happens afterwards, but it's, I think it's kind of more fun to run them one at a time. And here's the description. Now, this, this demonstrates clearly the power of Python. All I've done in here is say raw data set describe, and I'm getting the count, how many count, number of samples we have, and what is the mean value of each of the curves, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, and the 25, 50, and 70 percent lines. Pretty neat. Now we want to go pre-process this, this data. We have all this data. You can see that the, the means vary wildly. You have means that are as low as 0.1 to as high as 66. And the, the clustering that we're doing is based on distances between points. So we probably want to normalize the distance between points. And we're going to drop the nulls. And we are going to scale the data set. So let's go ahead and run this one. And then let's describe the new data and run this cell. And here is the new, let's see if I can make this any bigger. Now nah, it doesn't get any bigger. So here's the new data. So now you can see the values of the new data, and they are all pretty much comparable to each other. There's no huge discrepancies. They're all very similar, not exactly the same, but, but within the ranges. They're within a close order of magnitude of each other. So that, that helps a lot. Now, when you're doing cluster analysis, it helps to get an idea of how many clusters you would like to generate. I mean, you think you understand your data. Now, we're doing an unconventional reservoir here. 
we're doing a Barnett, so there's a lot of different data types. So we want some help in figuring out how many clusters we're going to want. So we're going to go in cell, and we're going to run the cell. And this one takes a little while because, well, not long. It's fast. Because we want to get an elbow method and predict the number of clusters. So here's two clusters, three. And the steeper the curve is, the better the model gets and the flatter the curve. And you can see the curve flattens out here after four, flattens a little bit after three. But I actually like six clusters. And I put the number of clusters here. If you're running this workflow in your own office, this is one of the parameters that you change, and you can change the number of clusters. You can put whatever number you want in here. I would suggest one is a bad number, and getting much above 10 or 11 is getting a little crazy. But other than that, you can go. So now we want to plot the results, and we're going to plot them using matplotlib. That's another utility that we provide as part of the PL distribution. And this is it. This is the whole plotting routine. It's, it's one of the things that, that, that really makes Python powerful. So then I run the cells, and here's the plot. And you can see the date. Now, I've run this before, so this green cluster, which is so obviously interesting. We're comparing rho B and neutron here. Um, that's because those are the first two curves that we put in the cluster analysis. This green is actually a dolomitic uh, Ellenberger. And it's the only, we have one well with a dolomitic Ellenberger, and that's why it's such a weird cluster. But that's interesting. So now we have that. Now we want, but that's not really enough to decide which facies is associated with which cluster. And by that I mean we're doing unsupervised classification. So it's not like we told in advance which cluster is associated with which facies. You could say, well, I think that cluster is maybe Lyme, and I, I think this cluster, I'm, I'm not sure what cluster these are. So, I mean, that one may be sand or, I, I don't know. So we, we go a step further and we visualize the pair plots using what's called a seaborn plot. And this is really cool. I think this is uh, one of the neatest things that we do in this uh, workflow. And this one does take a little while to run. Um, it, you know, not a terribly long time. And if you're running it on 100 wells, it would probably take a little while. But on uh, five or six wells, it's not too bad. So what do you get here in a seaborn plot? What you get is a series of cross plots of neutron versus neutron. And in this case, it gives you a histogram. Neutron versus rho B, neutron versus gamma ray, neutron versus DT, compressional, DT shear. And nice to see the differentiation here and the neutron versus PE. And that allows you to go through and get a better idea of which cluster is actually associated with which facies. For example, I can look at the gamma ray and say, aha, cluster 4 is definitely going to be associated with my high kerogen content facies because it's got the highest gamma ray. I can also say cluster 6 and cluster 1 are going to be my carbonate facies because they've got a very low neutron porosity and a high density. And I would suspect that cluster 5 is going to be dolomite and cluster 0 is going to be limestone. So this allows you to go through and aid you in assigning the clusters of the facies. The last thing we want to do is demonstrate that we can also use Plotly to generate a cross plot. And Plotly gives you some additional functionality that Matplotlib doesn't. It allows you to go in and hide clusters so that you can see what's underneath it and then bring the cluster back. Like I might want to hide the, the red cluster and see how the green, the blue, and the purple cluster are distributed. Okay, well, I'm happy with this cluster analysis. I think I've got some really good results. And I'm going to want to go ahead and write it to the database. So I run my cells. And it's going to start saving it for the well. Now we want to go back and look at these wells and see what the clusters actually look like. 
So let's take a look at a log plot of one of the wells. Here it is, and here's the cluster, the k-means cluster that we just generated. And as you can see, it's pretty darn good. Here's our limes, here's our shaley limes, here's our shales. Now you may say to yourself, the knowledgeable observer is going to say, wait a minute, this was an unsupervised classification and you've already somehow got the facies assigned. And I did that because I've run this before. And I already I, and the results are fairly consistent. But as you can see, the names don't actually match up with the colors. Um, so I built these facies here, these uh, color codings. This is one we built called and I'll go down and scroll and pick it so you can see what I called it. And I built this using the custom, there it is, custom builder. I call it the limey sand. And that's a custom facies that we added in. And now it doesn't let me rename these afterwards, but I, I would have to go in and adjust these to match to get the facies. But the important thing is that we were able to differentiate all the facies. So here we have the high carriage and volume zones. Here we have the main productive intervals within the Barnett. Here we have the lime. We can go look at some of the other wells. So we have another well with, and you can see the, the Shaley zones. It does a really good job of differentiating the clusters. You can see the shales, the limey sands, the high volumes. Everything is pretty well being differentiated. The reason I'm going on is I want to show you that well. This is another one with the lime. And then this is the weird well that has the Dolomitic Ellenberger here. And uh, that is the zone that, and although we identified it as a sand lime in our statmen, uh, could easily be a Dolomitic uh, Ellenberger. And that's our introduction to unsupervised machine uh, facies classification using machine learning techniques. Now, if you own PowerLog and you wish to get a copy of this analysis for your own personal use, you are welcome to send me an email at fredjensen at cgg.com and I will send you this Python uh, Jupyter workflow and if you've got the Python distribution installed from 971, you are welcome to use it. Uh, we wrote it, and we're allowed to distribute it to anyone who's interested. So I thank you for your time and attention, and hope you return and look at some of the other videos we have online. Thank you.